Susan, uh, thanks for joining us from the jungles uh, of Thailand. I don't know if your your video is working uh, today. Oh, Floor is yours. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, I'm a <laughs> I'm a Korean Canadian New Yorker. Uh, I was born uh, 40 minutes from the world's most heavily armed border in Seoul, South Korea. My parents decided. Uh, my father's an industrial engineer, so he decided that. Uh, it would be safer for us to leave uh, the military dictatorship that it was at this time. Uh, Korea didn't have a democracy until 1988. So, but unfortunately, he chose um, Isfahan, Iran, uh, to move us to where he uh, was working with Shell Petroleum. And uh, we lived there happily for two years until there was uh, escalating violence uh, with the unfolding of the Islamic Revolution. And uh, in 1977, we left uh, uh, for uh, London kind of sort of in a in a very untenable uh, position in London illegally uh, not allowed to stay and then we made our way to Canada uh, fortunately because my father's business partner sponsored all six of us into the country and that's where uh, that's where I grew up and so uh, then shortly afterwards I went back to Korea to do a year of high school to relearn my language because this is very important uh, you know, you must be able to argue in the same language with your parents, with the native tongue of your parents, uh, because, you know, a lot gets lost, uh, you know, transforming emotions and thoughts into words, never mind from words then into other languages. So I did a year of high school uh, in Korea to relearn uh, Korean and then came back uh, and eventually I uh, had an internship in Hong Kong and uh, worked all around the world as a journalist. Uh, I, I became a journalist at age 16 uh, as an honor translator for the Olympics uh, because I was uh, working for the European Broadcasting Union when I was 16, uh, just in the logistics office. And then I worked with them. I met the broadcast crew actually on a, on a tour bus. Uh, and um, they asked me, you know, because they hadn't budgeted for translators and hadn't realized just how few people speak Korean uh, and how few Korean speakers spoke English uh, back in, back at that time, which was in 1988, during the Summer Solar Olympics. And so uh, they, when I met those journalists, they were probably the hippest, coolest, and happiest grown-ups I'd ever met in my life. Uh, my parents are, you know, fundamentalist Christian engineers, uh, and very sort of serious-minded. And uh, it was, you know, very, very strict and conservative in my household. And it was my first time meeting a group of uh, group of storytellers who are so creative and uh, emotionally honest in their expression and their curiosity about the world that I just really wanted to be a lot like them. And so when they asked me if I wanted to do a few stories with them, I, I jumped at the chance uh, and it, it launched my journalism career. So I went back uh, to Canada, finished high school, uh, got an internship in Hong Kong, uh, was going to stay for one month and ended up staying for uh, four years to see the handover and cover the handover with uh, Newsweek and the independent, the broadsheet in, uh, in London, the U in the UK. So I uh, worked as a journalist for many years, about 25 years, about seven of which I transitioned, transitioned into advertising and marketing simply because it was way more fun, uh, quicker, and it was, it was more pay. So storytelling became content, became packaged, and it was no longer fun uh, for me within, within that structure. Uh, then, you know, dabbled briefly in, uh, in major motion picture film, worked on both produ the production side and on the camera, uh, in front of the camera, just doing some extras work and a few speaking roles, uh, eventually then, but continuously writing, uh, as a journalist throughout. And I started writing about technology when I was in Chicago, uh, when I moved to Chicago and, uh. From there, the companies that I covered would then turn around and ask me to then consult with them on their storytelling strategy and community building. Uh, I, I say those two because it's called growth hacking or audience development. But the only way to organically really grow a community is through original storytelling. So all my life, I was laughed at by my engineer family as to, you know, you just work with words, but we actually build stuff, right? Uh, and it finds 
that, that if you're actually building stuff and you want to make it useful for people to be able to use it, you have to be able to find a vernacular or language that evokes people's hearts and imaginations so they see the problems that you're solving and you know what you best love about what you're building and how it can serve people. And uh, eventually I worked with different um, artificial uh, intelligence based companies and startups uh, doing growth hacking, storytelling and consulting to find my own AI based company about four years ago. And then, uh, in a way, I kind of failed at that because I went to go launch an AI company uh, and it's still it's it's uh, still in development. Uh, it's launched as an LLC uh, in Montreal um, and uh, in New York, but it's very, very close to being able to deploy uh, a prototype. Uh, but in that process, I would there was so much of a learning curve and it. You know, if I'd known how hard it was going to be, then I don't think I would have started. Uh, I didn't know that it would be four years uh, in constantly pivoting and, and productizing, and there's so many different layers. And, uh, you know, you solve one problem, it's like a string you pull, opens up other problems. But I can see so clearly, and it's so uh, close, in, uh, close within gas. So, um, I know, I went to launch an AI company, but instead helped launch an NGO, which with the full support of the Office of Partnerships uh, at the UN General Assembly uh, in New York, you know, UNHQ. And I think that's where we met, Marcello, uh, is within the UN network. And then, of course, I saw you at Kennet and at Catapult and uh, different places. Uh, wherever there is social impact uh, and technology and startup overlap, uh, it's, uh, it's very much, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a unique space because there are ways that technology uh, can and must serve people to automate processes and make clear things uh, that are mission critical that need to get done, but that aren't necessarily best for human beings to do, that are better tracked um, by, by machines. So, um, see, have I covered my background? Yeah, so it's uh, good to... Uh... <laughs> To have that um, perspective from the past. Well, what about the present? I mean, how come you ended up in the jungle in Thailand, and uh, what were the uh, kind of pillars <laughs> so, behind that? Yeah. Uh, so I came here uh, in March. You know, um, off the heels of Davos at the World Economic Forum and a couple of other places uh, that I went to for fundraising, and I was invited to Phuket by a, a group of companies, special vehicle, uh, business vehicles, who had, uh, and we've been talking for two years about them incubating my startup Mucker. And so I came down here for one week, uh, work week, and then uh, New York got rocked with COVID and you know, uh, the pandemic just locked the world down. And so considering that uh, five days after I arrived in Phuket to, to work with this group, um, they said to me, you know, the uh, airport is going under lockdown and they're going to, the military is closing the bridge and they're sealing. Uh, they see that Thailand was able to contain COVID by sealing neighborhood by neighborhood and island by island. And so they said, you can leave tomorrow or considering how, uh, you know, the death count is es escalating so quickly in New York, it's probably safe for you to stay. But if you're going to stay, it's going to be for three months. So I made the I made the difficult decision to stay. I, actually, it was an easy decision in the way that it's the sa safest place possible. Yeah. And what are the things you know? You're in a theoretically privileged position, so to say, you know, living in kind of paradise in a jungle, um, beautiful place that people would love to go on holidays. I uh, I guess that uh, your commutes to work every day is on the back of an elephant. Uh, you no, know, you have elephant taxis. Yeah. For, uh, no. Kids, just, never ride an elephant. It's mean. Feed them and love them and revere them, but don't ride elephants. Uh, uh, no, no, no. Um, every day is different. And, uh, you know, uh, this is the longest, the six months that I've been here in Thailand is the longest I've been in one country or one city in close to five years. Uh, normally, in, in the process of building my company and going myself, going through consulting and through my I uh, work with NGOs and IGOs within the UN network. Uh, I was traveling 20 to 25 uh, days a month, only in New York, maybe five to 10 days a month, and uh, sleeping only four to six hours uh, a day. 
And so for the first three months, um, I cried for New York and those that were lost and, uh, and slept for about three months. Uh, and um, how to make my way in this, in this new reality. Very careless um, idiots are not wearing their mask and washing their hands and, and respecting social distancing. And the longer that goes on, the more this virus will uh, continue to mutate and um, find hosts. So I decided to stay in Thailand for two months uh, and then hopefully go visit my family in Vancouver uh, and, and make my way back to New York to continue my work. I, you do what you can. I mean, I can work remotely. It's beautiful. It's really, really important, um, I think, every day to take a moment and to set your intention for the day. And I'm just so eternally grateful that you know, that the, that the kingdom of Thailand is hosting us, um, you know, COVID refugees and granting, uh, you know, a visa amnesty and was able to contain the disease and allow us, uh, you know, some sort of freedom and, and normality of, you know, in, in movement and in, in being outdoors. Uh, that was a huge help. So every day I see a different uh, sunrise and um, take in nature, take a deep breath, count to a hundred, meditate, spend at least an hour by myself. And then I open my messages and see who needs what and what needs to get done. Just roll on with your work in, in whatever ways. And you're in a very, I would say your position is very special because you are in a beautiful place, but uh, you're kind of there against your will, even though you're very welcome by the kingdom. I am um, wondering. Uh, lots of people want to have a nomadic lifestyle, right? And you have definitely something that could be defined as such, moving around. And I was meeting new people in, the, in different environments. But uh, you're not there by choice, even though it's obviously a very pleasant place to be stuck. And I'm in a similar situation in the Swiss countryside. Lots of people in a, a far worse uh, environment mm -hmm. against the will. So what are the uh, nomadic lifestyle? No, no place like home. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, first of all, I mean, there's no place like home, right? Like Dorothy yeah. says, <laughs> there's no place but, uh, like home. But you know, I was kind of going through some rough spots where the places that I miss being home are no longer those places. New York is not the same New York that I left, and it won't be for a really long time. Um, most of these cities won't be. And so it's just figuring out, well, what am I homesick for? Who am I homesick for? And how do I create a new home uh, in a sense? But, you know, in some ways, I, I was born an expat and a nomad, right? I was four years old when I boarded my first flight. I'm 49 now, so that means that I've been flying for 45 years. Uh, and I have lived, I have continuously lived in different countries, about a dozen cities over, you know, over the 45 years uh, since then. So a nomadic lifestyle, I don't, a nomadic sounds so itinerant, you know, there was no nomad culture that ever left behind uh, best practices of building a civilization or that were able to scale, were able to build up to any sense of grandeur. They left some really uh, pivotal technologies. I mean, the reason how, you know, the, the Mongols, uh, especially in 9th century BC, when they would invade Korea, the reason why they were able to dominate um, Asia was was because they domesticated horses, which is one form of technology, and they put fire to meat and gave us barbecue, and they left us, you know, the famous Korean barbecue. But they gave them a huge advantage uh, in strength, and in numbers and in mobility. Uh, but that's all we know is that they're warriors, nomadic, and those two technologies that they left behind. Uh, when people say that they're uh, digital nomads, it's like when people say. For instance, you know, the field that I work in now, uh, which is AI and blockchain integration or AI and blockchain or, or deep tech, as people call it, I always like to ask, you know, how do you define that and what does that mean to you and what does that look like to you? Because though I've lived in so many different uh, countries, you know, all around the world in different cities, uh, I, it was really important for me to feel that that new place had meaning for me, that I was there. Uh, you know, to solve a problem, to experience or learn something. And that, you know, I had created, uh, you know, a cradle of home, co home comforts and a network of friends, uh, friends and mentors and, and associates and collaborators that whom I truly enjoyed. 
and whose process and work that I that I really ex respected and wanted to be more like, wanted to emulate. So that's that. As long as I have, you know, I've always said I can live anywhere, and anywhere and everywhere is home. As long as I have meaningful work, and I have friends, you know, I'm I'm nothing without my friends. You know, a higher vision of myself that I want to be more like, and I hope that if I hang around them and learn from them, uh, that some some of their sparkle, and some of their uh, intelligence or know-how will rub, rub off on me. So, so every place feels like home. I guess I'm a nomad, but I don't really feel like I'm an itinerant nomad. I feel like I'm truly a global citizen, that where I plant my feet, that home resides in me, and home resides in, my, in the richness and the depth of my relationships uh, of people that I respect um, and who treat me with kindness and respect. Uh, uh, and a, a sense of progression in, in the world that I want to see I guess when I was younger, when I was a teenager, and you know, I was I was a total rebel. You know, I had a sunray moonhawk, and I was a punk rocker, and you know, I was uh, I was angry in a way that I was trying to make sense of the world on my own terms. And in some ways, I became a journalist at 16 because I wanted to understand my parents, and I wanted to understand history as to how these global events uh, affect them so deeply in our home life. And it was only through that work that I started to understand not only my parents and my immediate family and to find a language that lands in the story that, uh, that we can all be a part of and, and share uh, and discuss whether we agree or not. Uh, we don't have to agree on everything, but as long as we're talking, things are good. Uh, so uh, it's only through that work that I'm able to not find my place in the world. It's not my job to find my place in, in the world. The world owes you nothing, <laughs> not necessarily fair. Uh, it was my job to make my way in this world. When I was younger, the geography and where I was and who I was hanging out with uh, changed me and affected me greatly. And as I became uh, into my own self and my self mastery, now wherever I land, I affect the landscape and the geography and I create the things and the relationships that I love and need to sustain myself around me. So it's a very different, uh, dynamic as you get older so yeah kids there are things to definitely to look forward to, to getting older for sure yeah do you think that uh, having um, an angry teenage phase made you a, a more peaceful and uh, kind of fulfilled person uh, in your later years do you think that going through that phase and having that intensity uh, was positive uh, in the long term for sure Definitely for me, because uh, remember, I, I was born in war. I mean, Korea has been at, at war. Well, it's been in treaty since 1950, but really, you know, it's, it's, it's either a silent war or it's a war war. Uh, I, and there were a lot of things that weren't uh, openly discussed or allowed to be discussed uh, and lanced in, in my family. But everyone has their own way and everyone has their own temperament. I've, you know, I've, I've always been a scrapper. Though I, this I do believe is that, um, first of all, uh, pain is not relative, no matter who you are, whether you're rich, poor, of any background or color, irrespective of geography and time, we all face our own struggles, or at least we should. Uh, you only know who you are and what can be, uh, and come to the truth of things when you face a challenge straight on. And, uh, and navigate your fear. It's very important to accept fear. I mean, for me, it was, because what is anger, right, or depression? It's, it's fear of hurt. It's, uh, it's fear of hurt and it's uh, um, and a repression of that or, or a denial of that, right, because you come out swinging. So it's really important to be like, you know, I am afraid, all right, and then let's look at it and then come to the realization in most cases there is nothing to be afraid, you know? And so struggle is very important. Problem solving is very important. You don't, you are not your thoughts and you are not your feelings, uh, but you do own your actions. And so, and you are not a problem. You're simply everything that comes at, everything that comes at me is a puzzle to be solved. Every problem has a solution. And all I'm doing is just, you know, getting another tool to put under my belt. I know this sounds 
surprise, like really, really cliche and kind of cheesy. Um, but it's so true, you know. Uh, by the time I was uh, six years old, um, twice my father had come in, you know, sometime during the day or late at night and say, okay, we're leaving. Each of you get to pick one thing to take with you. And that was it. In some cases, I didn't, in, when we were leaving Korea, I didn't even know uh, we were leaving the country. I thought we were going on holiday until uh, I saw my great grandmother and she was crying. And she held me really close and said, you know, uh, don't forget me and listen to your parents. And I was like, why are you crying? <laughs> You know, um, but that's that's not the greatest struggle. I mean, the greatest struggles that are facing this generation is, you know, how do you find meaning when you, you are born in chaos? And how do you find a career and make your way in this world when, um, you know, education is expensive and you're not sure about part-time jobs and you're not sure if you're going to get a real job. And there's an energy before me now, you know, in the 30s that I never lived uh, in a recession. And so that is also a struggle. But we can we can all make our way, but we speak honestly about our experiences, that we understand our anger and unpack that anger into and solidify it into a sense of will, and um, talk honestly about about problems. Don't gloss everything over. Don't you don't have to be nice. You just have to be genuine, and you just have to be honest and well-intentioned. And I think, uh, I think there's a real, you know, yearning for that, which is why, you know, we're having these things and we're talking about these things. But frequently as young people and as teenagers, we're told to be in cognitive dissonance. You know, we're told to be nice and to be polite. Don't be honest. Don't be true. Don't express yourself. Be quiet. But work hard towards what? You know, if, if I had meaning as, as to why I was working hard and how it was helping others and how it was helping me, then of course I would work hard. Yes? No? I, I think most of us would. So, um, struggle is an inter inherent part of character building. And uh, it got me really full with asking myself and others hard, direct questions. Because really, it's only the hard questions that are, you know, that are worthwhile, I think. To delve into, uh, I, I like your comment in terms of the toolbox and having certain elements that uh, when you start, um, the kits available as a teenager is relatively limited. And um, we have those raw feelings like uh, being angry at the world, at your family, at yourself. And uh, yesterday I was listening to the uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is kind of preparing you uh, to understand what's important in life. And I uh, had never had a chance uh, to read through that. And uh, it, it does mention uh, that there is a rightful anger, which is anger without hatred. Now, a hatred is very destructive and um, it um, prevents you from following certain paths in life because uh, it, it pretty much blocks uh, certain options to say, I would never do that because I hate it so much. And what I think that teenagers could uh, attempt to do is to use this anger, this indignation as energy saying, which is ha what's happening right now with climate change and with uh, so many other uh, situations that are getting teenagers more politically engaged than before. And just tell them anger is not necessarily bad as energy, like everything yeah. else, but what are you doing with this energy? What are you building with it? And you know, trying to uh, get them to flow into a direction that is going to be productive for them now, but also in the future. Sure, 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 sure. I think, uh, I know, like, so like the big intangibles, like words like love and hate are um, very personally uh, defined. And um, I agree with you. I, I think anger is a drug. I think anger is where, you know, laughter um, boosts your immune system and, um, and allows you to see things in different ways and different perspectives. And somewhere in there uh, is a solution or a, at least a doorway and a path uh, that can, that's visible. So, uh, you know, I, I get mad. I get, I get mad over sometimes over stupid things and I take a moment and take a breath and, and um, see the funny side of it or develop a dark sense of humor. Remember, I think I remember saying this to you once at a conference of 
you know, if you work in social impact and, and you see sort of uh, the, you see sort of the, um, the challenges and the, in a, you know, the lack of effectiveness and the lack of motion sometimes, it's very important to develop a dark sense of humor uh, about things uh, as you're working your way and to, and to manage expectations. So um, I think what you're talking about that, that is it, what you call anger, I would probably define as, as moral indignation, a sense yeah, of, indignation. maybe a sense of outrage, <laughs> at, you know, injustices or things that don't make sense. When things don't make sense, you follow the money and then you figure out, okay, well, this is what's going on. Um, and um, yeah, and that can be really powerful. It's like a very powerful motivator. Uh, but only when it's anchored to a great sense of love and care that, you know, uh, I am a steward. So you only know deep love when you know uh, deep fear and anger and hatred, right? Uh, one of the rules of the universe is, are, is that, that the dualities or, or sometimes the triangulations, the sacred threes of, uh, of opposing forces. And um, I, you know, I recognize and accept uh, every emotion that comes to my way, recognizing that I am not it. I am aware of my emotions and, and uh, accepting of them. And then I always bring it back to why I feel that way and see if it's rooted in, in a sense of love and care and really a higher sense of myself and what I, what I want to do. You know, how do I want to show up and who do I want to be in this world? You know, it's not to be like this, you know, miserable, uh, angry schmuck. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, to move with conviction. But anger, like I said, is a drug. You know, I get mad and I feel powerful and then you're mad and you feel powerful, you know. Uh, and we don't make the most cogent decisions and look 360 for unintended consequences, right? So in that heat of the moment, I suggest you go work out, go do your house cleaning, um, you know, go kick some rocks and throw some rocks into into a lake. Uh, I took martial arts for four years, and uh, I, a year of it I trained in Korea, uh, three to four hours a day, six days a week, until I uh, until I exercise parts of my anger. Uh, so yeah there are positive ways that you can you know vent that energy and especially for young teenage boys I mean you don't know why you feel so riled up but I know this from my guy friends and you know from my guy friends mentors I uh, have friends that are brothers to me that uh you know especially in young men uh in in their teen years it's really important for you to have uh you know a healthy uh, socially acceptable way of, of getting rid of that anger and that violence venting it, whether it's competitive sports or video games. And I absolutely do not believe that uh, video games begets violence. I think injustice, uh, a sense of hopelessness begets violence. Uh, video games, rock on, play them all you want. You'll become a ruthless strategist and develop great timing and hand-eye coordination. So until you can vent that energy uh, and that anger, and that sense of despair, all your emotions should be accepted and processed. Because if you don't, then it doesn't, when I don't do that, it doesn't make room for all the things that I do love and revere and want to feel, like love and laughter uh, and just joy over stupid things and just generally being in a good mood, you know, singing songs, eating freshly made food, hanging out with, with friends that just, you know, can always make you smile. There's no room for that unless, there's no room for that and there's no nuance for that and there's no developing. A, a vocabulary and an awareness and articulation of that until you accept every single emotion, including anger and hatred, accept it and process and let it go. And then that's, that's how you know where you're at and what you're really feeling. I was just thinking while you're talking that um, it would be very useful uh, during the teenage years when your toolbox is still quite limited in terms of how to understand uh, your own self and the hormones and the bouts of uh, frustration uh, that you feel um, because of these limitations and uh, uh, your surroundings. It, it would be really helpful to uh, have an imaginary twin brother or twin sister, someone who deeply loves you as much as 
that person a person can love another someone who is genetically identical to you so can really understand what's happening but someone who's not you someone who's very detached and just imagine having this twin sibling next to you when you're going through those difficult periods and um, have this imaginary conversation saying why is the world so unfair and why uh, has betty not invited me for her birthday party and uh, try to create this internal dialogue that uh, should drain some of this energy and try to uh, imagine uh, lots of possibilities. Well, maybe you didn't get invited to the birthday party because uh, she has a budget issue and she cannot invite more than 20 people. And um, her mom told her that she needs to invite these 10 people and therefore you didn't make to the list. Don't imagine the worst. I, it, it's important to have this kind of a palette of several options when you're trying to understand what's happening around you. Uh, but it needs to come from an inner voice that most teenagers haven't developed yet. So I think you can be very purposeful in terms of saying, what are the possibilities here? You know, it's not only the worst case scenario, which is something that is quite common as a teenager you just think that the world is against you, you know, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Sure, for sure. I mean, you know what, when I was a teenager, everything was wonderful or everything was horrible. And my emotions were so intense because, you know, my world was small, but I didn't know that it was, right? I was just still discovering myself and I didn't know anything. Um, I just thought I knew everything <laughs> because my world was so small. Um, and so, you know, as you get older, the world gets bigger and you won't feel as intensely and things will, uh, you know, make more sense. Sorry, there's lots of bugs here in the jungle. Uh, and things will make more sense. And it's just, you know, to just ask, you know, will this matter in three days, in three hours, three days, three years? Will this matter? Uh, is it true? Is it kind? Is it helpful to me, to what I want? Right? Yeah. And to know that in the continuum of time and, and, and as time goes on, even within six months to 12 months in your teenage years, what you want and what you think you know and what you know of yourself and who you become will constantly change. And it'll be, it'll be exciting. It'll be harrowing. It'll be all those things. And it's really a sacred and blessed time. You know, you get to be your own social experiment for the next few years and feel everything. And, and most of, and hopefully most of you are, are safe. And, and cradled and fed and just try not to do things of lasting consequence because if <laughs> no, life yeah, is well, to have. Not, yeah yeah no. yeah yeah i mean you know internet cut out is, is is not such a bad thing but when it's your only lifeline to the world and it's like oh my god i'm isolated you know it's like living in an island where are you guys um uh, broadcasting out of where is everybody uh situated in well we uh um, run a team of volunteers like everybody's here because they want to help and support uh, the efforts and um, i'm based in switzerland and we have um, 16 hours of programming um, once a month uh, over the last weekend of the month so this first session is based in singapore so we have the singapore studio that is um, run by um, Asuli and uh, her mother Yenike and also the brother San, uh, Tan, uh, uh, San Yen because um, uh, he's uh, got some uh, tests, he cannot join us today. And later mm -hmm. on today, Hi. we have um, the uh, <laughs> California studio, right? So they're based in Santa Barbara. I see, and I that's see, so basically. all around the world. Yeah, so we have uh, three bases um, that allows us to have uh, programming that um, covers the whole planet. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can have at least four hours of programming um, both on Saturday and Sunday. And then that's oh, that working well. Oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, you, know, and, you, know, I, you know, it just occurred to me. So I, when I was a teenager and I didn't really have like a baseline knowledge of what it was that I wanted to do, and how I, I could be effective. I went to this, uh, I went to this you know, Catholic high school that graduates a large number of Olympic, Winter Olympic athletes in Canada uh, called Bishop Carroll High School. And uh, I'm not Catholic, so I didn't want to, you know, study the catechism or uh, anything like that. So 
sorry, I've got I've got a twelve week old puppy that's like wanting to okay. All right. Uh so what they would do is we would volunteer an hour a week. Uh, instead of taking religious studies, I would get high school credit for that. And I realized that volunteering was such a great way to uh, meet other people and to find out where somebody else happy. And uh, so, you know, if you can, and if you're not, you know, be busy feeding yourself and helping the family, working part-time job, uh, you know, see if you can volunteer, you know, even if it's just like a half hour a week or an hour a week. And, um, and it's it's a great learning uh, curve. You really learn not just new skills and about people, but you also learn what you really care about and 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 your role in it, what you like doing to try and solve it. And of course, your relationship, my relationship with myself improves uh, when I keep my promises to myself, when I'm honest with myself and allow myself to be honest. Uh, and my relationship with myself improves when I help others when I know that I have something to give. Yeah, and also these days what happens is that you can volunteer to help someone or some cause on the other side of the planet, right? So there's so many options that it becomes an issue. You know, oh, so, many options. so some curation in terms of uh, yeah. topics and um, you know, what are the best options for what you're looking for, and uh, they'll be needed. But this is a very good uh, bit of advice you just shared with us. I mean, I, you know, uh, especially because of my travel schedule, I. Uh, when I started working in tech startups about seven years ago, seven, eight years ago, uh, and my schedule just became really untenable, I, for the first time in my life since I was 16, I couldn't, you know, volunteer. I didn't have a regular schedule. I was traveling all the time. And so I just made a promise to myself that I would take care of whoever or whatever, uh, you know, being was in front of me. And however incidental and however glancing or however brief, I would just do that, whether it's, you know, opening a door or helping someone with heavy groceries, um, or you know, stopping at the side of the road and asking that person, you know, whose car broke down, do you need to use my cell phone? Um, are you okay? Whatever it was, and just what you you do, I do what I can with what, what I've got at any given time. And it's just knowing that if if I am a citizen of this world and I'm a steward of this planet, I, and I'm a steward of living, then I'm just going to take care of what's in front of me according to what what I can do reasonably right and as long as i approach it with a sense of humor and some problem solving uh you know other people like it too i hey, thank you so much for your time i know that it's difficult when you're in the middle of the jungle with